Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our lecture on uh, technological revolutions. Uh, this is uh, the uh, second uh, lecture in um, CSC 110. And uh, today I'm going to go over uh, the first topic in our syllabus. And so uh, let me just show you uh, what you should see so far in your Canvas site. So if we go here to um, my whiteboard, what you see, what you're looking at is our Canvas page, the way it looks uh, right now. Now, after um, this video, there'll be a link to the video and there'll also eventually be a link to uh, your first uh, short assignment. OK, but we're on this section right now on uh, technological revolutions. You can see here that I have a summary. So if I click on that summary, um, you could see that it's just a short uh, summary of what we're going to be talking about uh, today. OK, so um, uh, that's what we're doing uh, in this particular lecture. OK, so uh, first of all, why am I even talking about technological revolutions? in the context of a course on uh, computers. And the reason is, is that in order to understand what's happening to us historically right now, it's sometimes useful to look at what's happened in the past. OK, and so we're really going to go through like the uh, totality of uh, human uh, history very quickly, of course, uh, in, in terms of like, uh, you know, how technology has changed us. And uh, we're going to hopefully see some themes that come out of that that will describe, you know, what's happening uh, to us today. OK, so I'm going to start way back. I'm going to go all the way back to a timeline of everything just to give you a sense of, you know, how many years ago things uh, uh, occurred. OK, so um, uh, so that's why I entitled this the, the time like timeline of everything a little bit facetious. But uh, if you ask a, a very simple question, you know, uh, how old is the universe? Well, first, did the universe, like everything, did everything have a beginning, a time before which there was no time? And uh, that's really a, a cosmological question, a physics question. And the answer is, yeah, we seem to think that, um, that uh, let me see if this works. Yeah, OK. We seem to think that um, <clears throat> the universe began some um, 13 billion years ago. OK, so um, before that, nah, who knows? But, you know, that's the so-called Big Bang. All right. So then, you know, stuff evolved and the Earth came into existence. You might go, well, when when did that happen? And the Earth came into existence about four billion years ago. OK, so uh, that's how long the Earth has been here now for the first billion years or so. And again, I'm just doing this to give you a context of like, you know, how how big these numbers are. OK, uh, for the first billion years ago, there was no life on Earth. We think that life on Earth. Uh, in the form of little tiny microorganisms began some three billion years ago. OK, now for the longest time, all you had was like little microbes and they underwent their own evolution. But eventually we got animals or uh, the beginnings of the differentiation into uh, different types of um, uh, creatures that we um, would kind of recognized today. OK, and this was known as the Precambrian era. And that happened about uh, 542 million years ago. OK, so you could see that there was quite a bit of time, like close to two and a half billion years. There's a one and a half billion years in there. Uh, no, no, I, I had it right. Two and a half billion years during which life was just microbial. And then it started to form into these very interesting uh, multicellular uh, creatures, things that you would uh, identify today as plants and animals. OK, and uh, then you might say, well, when did the dinosaurs live? Because, you know, the dinosaurs are kind of a, a benchmark. Uh, it was a very long period of time that they lived, but they began about 237 million years ago. OK, and uh, then you might ask the question, well, how long have human like creatures, hominids lived? And um, this is a harder question to answer because it depends what you mean by a hominid or, you know, whether you're talking about like, you know, um, our closest relatives like chimpanzees and gorillas and so on. Uh, Six million years. Some people will put it three million years. Uh, by the way, this is not my expertise. I'm just going by what I've read on various Wikipedia pages and it's not terribly important that we get these dates exact is so I want to show you how quickly things happened okay on earth all right and uh, uh, so so you know that's when our sort of relatives um, have been on earth okay now there are many different types of human species and uh, you know you can look this up if you've ever taken a course in um, prehistoric anthropology you would know about all like homo erectus and so on and uh, uh, we ourselves as a species 
are homo sapiens, okay? Now, what does a species mean? Then that's actually a, a definition that comes out of biology. A species, uh, uh, any two, uh, any two um, members of a species uh, can meet, mate, and multiply, okay? So if two members of a species, uh, uh, two animals of a species, they'll meet, they, they'll mate and they produce fertile offsprings, then that those two uh, uh, um, creatures are considered to be part of the same species, okay? Now, uh, and th there's a lot of variations on that, but that's good enough. But you might be surprised that, uh, you know, there's some animals that are not a species, like mules. You go, a mule's not a species? Yeah, because a mule's produced from a horse and a donkey, and, uh, you know, a horse and a donkey can mate and produce uh, uh, an offspring, a mule, but mules can't mate and produce more uh, offsprings, okay? So, you know, they have to be able to, to propagate the, the species. So, anyhow, I just wanted to, you know, if you've had biology, you might want to know, well, what do you even mean by a species? That's what we mean. So, you can ask this question, how long has the Homo sapiens, our species, how long have we been here on Earth? Okay, and again, numbers varied. I've looked up a, a lot of different things. And, and again, this is not terribly important that we get the dates exactly right. But Homo sapiens uh, have only been on Earth for about 200,000 years. Now, take a look at these numbers. Like, you know, you could see that they're, they're uh, becoming more and more recent, 200,000 years ago in terms of geological time, which is why I gave you all these numbers, okay? Um, 200,000 mil, uh, 200, years is just like, it's like that, okay? It's like overnight as far as evolution goes, okay? Uh, dinosaurs have been on, on Earth, uh, um, I guess, thousands of times longer than humans have been on Earth, okay? So uh, Homo sapiens aren't that long. And so again, what that means is that if you went back in time, you know, uh, you could go back in time up to 200,000 years and you would recognize that, you know, these creatures on Earth are you, you know, they're Homo sapiens, just like you, okay? And now we can start to ask the question, this is this is really where we, we want to start uh, uh, thinking about this, okay? Um, because Homo sapiens are tool makers, you know, we make a lot of tools, our life is filled with tools. In fact, our life is so filled with tools that you don't even think about tools, and it's uh, part of the nature of technology that it's transparent to us, okay? And uh, this was actually the work of a philosopher by the name of Heidegger, in case you take any uh, courses in philosophy, you might study uh, Heidegger's being in time. And uh, I'll, t I'll sort of show you what I mean by that, that technology is transparent to us. Uh, when you want to, uh, like, go outside or whatever, you open the door. Okay, so you have to turn the doorknob. Uh, you don't think about the doorknob when you do that. What are you thinking about? You're thinking about getting outside. Okay, but that door, that doorknob, all of that, that's tools. Okay, those are those are machinery. And so you're just going to reach out your hand, turn that doorknob, and you're barely going to be conscious about what you're doing because what you are conscious of is I want to go outside I want to get to my car I got to go to the store or whatever you're projecting into the future what you're what you want to do and the tools that you're using in the present just kind of disappear and if you think about that that's even how you use a computer when when you know how to use a computer well any tool but a computer is a tool you know you'll just like click here click there click there you don't have to think about it. If you do have to think about it, then it becomes frustrating. So for instance, if you're going to go outside and you go to, uh, you know, turn the doorknob and all of a sudden the doorknob doesn't work, that's when you know there's a doorknob there. Okay, so the technology presents itself when it breaks, when it doesn't do what you want it to do. But as long as the technology is doing what you want it to do, the instrument just becomes transparent. So it's like it becomes an extension of your body in a strange kind of way, as far as your mind is concerned. Okay, uh, you know, it's not physically an extension of your body, but as far as your mind is concerned, your tools are just an extension of you. Okay, and uh, so when, when did this start? Uh, well, you know, um, about uh, uh, 200,000 years ago was when Homo sapiens were on Earth. Um, and, you know, they were tool makers, but they were very primitive tool makers. And so let's trace that technology out. Now, and now I think you can see why I wanted to go uh, all the way back to that point. Okay. So um, if you go back 200,000 years and you ask a very simple question, how did Homo sapiens live back in those days? Okay. Uh, the answer is um, we were hunter gatherers. Okay. Now, uh, there are very few uh, societies today that are still hunter gatherers. There are some, um, uh, like the the Khoisan of South Africa, and um, uh, maybe some of the uh, natives to to um, Australia might be. Uh, but you know, modern life has basically gone through the whole world. So um, you know, it's touched pretty much every single society on Earth. But hunter gatherers, um, what that means is that you'd wake up in the morning, and your 
uh, major task that day was to find food and feed yourself. OK, um, you had to if it were an, it was animals that you were going after, you'd have to chase your animals. OK, and if it was uh, vegetables that you wanted to eat, then you had to find already grown vegetables that you would dig up and like roots or berries and things like that. And you would eat those. OK, uh, so, you know, it was a very nomadic life. And that meant that you would just kind of travel and uh, wherever the animals were and uh, sometimes you'd have to migrate with the animals and uh, and hunt your food that way okay so um, let's see here um, I think I have hunter gatherers there we go so uh, this is the Wikipedia page on hunter gatherers and uh, I think there's a picture of the Khoisan down here but I actually like this picture here let's just bring that up OK, and what you're seeing in that picture is you can see in the hut in the background there. Uh, this is just temporary dwelling. OK, uh, because people are just going to they're, they're just going to uh, stop in a spot and gather up whatever food they can there and then move on. OK, and so that's the life of a hunter gatherer, uh, a very hard life uh, and um, um, not the way we live today, obviously. OK, not even the way we lived. Uh, in, um, recently in the past okay so something happened all right something very important happened and you might say well where does our food come today and we don't have to gather it so gathering doesn't mean you know like you know going out into the fields and picking the the crop that we planted gathering means finding it in the already grown by na by nature okay uh, so the the first kind of technological advance that humans made was we learned how to farm OK, uh, this is known as the Neolithic Revolution or the Agricultural Revolution. I'll tend to call it an Agricultural Revolution. Neolithic means New Stone Age. And uh, what happened was is we, we discovered something that seems so trivial to us today that, um, uh, you know, you, you're going to say, well, how could we not have known that? But, but you know, we, we didn't. And so what was that? Uh, we discovered um, two things. We discovered that if you take seeds and you put them in the ground, they grow. <laughs> OK, and so we learned how to farm. All right. And a lot of the crops that we farm today are not crops that existed, uh, at least not in the form they exist today when the um, agricultural revolution uh, started. Uh, that's because, um, you know, we kind of bred the plants that we wanted. And so wheat today is very different than wheat uh, uh, many thousands of years ago. OK. And uh, same thing with animals. That's, that's the second thing. So the first thing is we learned that if you put um, uh, seeds in the ground it grows okay and the other major source of food for us is um <clears throat> is uh, uh, uh animals okay so in a hunter gatherer you have to chase the animals and then and then uh, um you know kill them and eat them okay but uh, once you uh, learn what's called animal husbandry uh you learn how to uh, raise the animals with you and uh this is kind of cruel you know but this is the way humans were you know we learned that if you feed these animals they'll stick around OK, and uh, they'll stick around and then, you know, eventually they'll become more and more domesticated. And as they become domesticated, you could just go out and pick one. And that's the one you uh, you 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 slaughter and you eat that day. OK, and so that so that's what became our source of food. And that's what be, you know, both animal uh, food and plant food. OK, so, you know, hunter gatherer gave way to the um, agricultural revolution. So that's the next one. You might say, when did that happen? Remarkably. That happened only 12,000 years ago, okay? That's 10,000 BC. Remember, we're, we're like, well, we're in 2021, but, you know, if you go back 2,000 years uh, and then you go back 10,000 years more, that's 12,000 years. So 12,000 years ago is when we learned, uh, when the agricultural revolution uh, occurred, okay? And so if you take a look here, you know, 200,000 years, and let's just round us off to 10,000 years. That's like one in uh, you know, 200 compared to 10, 200,000 compared to 10,000, uh, 10, okay? Uh, that's like one in 20. So like out of um, 19 twentieths, okay, of 95% uh, 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 of Homo sapiens time on earth, we were hunter gatherers. And only 5% is us learning how to do uh, agriculture, okay? So this was a significant change. Now, <clears throat> uh, this is our first technological revolution. And so uh, we want to pause here and think about what happened. OK, you, you know, uh, hunter gatherer is pretty hard. Um, you, you have to keep chasing the, the food. And uh, what happens if your hunt doesn't go well? 
uh, well, that's not good. Okay, well, what happens if you come to a particular area and you know there hasn't been a lot of rain and there there isn't a lot of vegetables to dig out of the ground or berries to find? Well, then you know you're you're going to face starvation. Okay, you've got less control over your um, your life. Okay, and uh, it's nomadic. You got to keep chasing the food. All right, so you never you're never in one place at, a, at any given time. As soon as the agricultural revolution occurs things change now there were some people that were just did hunt on animal husbandry so they just had like uh like animals they didn't do the uh they didn't do the farming part they just did the um uh, the agricultural part they only did the uh, the animals uh they only had the animals okay they could move around they were nomadic okay it could be a little bit nomadic uh but you know if you plant a crop in a particular area and you go away well who's to stop someone from taking that crop or animals from eating that crop or whatever so the biggest change that occurs between these two um uh, well i didn't put hunter gatherer here but you know uh, this is the hunter gatherer right in here okay so the biggest change between the hunter gatherer and the agricultural revolution is moving around OK, and if you think about it now, you say, well, if you're going to stay in a particular spot all the time, uh, what does that mean? It means villages. So there were no villages before the agricultural revolution. Or if you wanted to call them villages, they were just temporary, uh, um, uh, you know, settlements. But people would have to move. So you didn't have any kind of elaborate houses or anything like that. It made no sense. OK, why would you spend all that energy? in just building a house that you'd have to leave behind anyhow. So the agricultural revolution led to that. So let's take a look at uh, um, what life looked like uh, in the Neolithic, okay? And so you can already see there that um, picture of, uh, of a house. I mean, I'll bring it up, okay? So there's uh, um, a typical Neolithic uh, um, uh, house. And this is probably a reconstruction. I didn't read the caption, but uh, it looks like, um, uh, it actually looks like the kind of houses that they had at, uh, in uh, southern Turkey at a location called Şatalıhöyük. I know that's a strange name for a Neolithic uh, uh, civilization that they excavated some time ago. But you could see that this is definitely much more of a permanent uh, um, settlement than what we had earlier with the, um, you know, with uh, with this. Okay, so. Um, yeah, uh, we, we start to have uh, villages, okay? And at the same time, this is going to be important for my next point, um, you might say, well, what, what, what did the tools look like? They were still stone tools, okay? That's why it's called Neolithic. It means New Stone Age. So they were, um, they were farming, but they were farming with these uh, stone tools, okay? So they, they were still using the older technology from the Paleolithic, from the hunter-gatherer period, when they, were, when they had stone tools, but now they were applying those tools to, um, to agriculture, okay? So this is the Neolithic. And I mean, I, we don't have to go through details, but you could see like there's maps there of how the Neolithic spread and so on. And, um, you know, people, uh, 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 archaeologists uh, have have looked at that uh, carefully and if they got good reasons to believe these uh, uh, you know the, the the evidence that they're giving okay now um, <clears throat> what did that mean in terms of the change in our lifestyle okay well the biggest change I already mentioned is between nomadic and uh, uh, stationary or sedentary and a sedentary means that you had villages okay but it also meant other things too and uh, this is part of the dark side of our humanity you see, um, if you farmed and you got all this grain, you had to store the grain because, you know, uh, farming goes in seasons. Like in, in, in Europe, at least in southern Europe, okay, around the Mediterranean, wheat grows over the winter and then, you know, there's no wheat during the summer. So you had to collect the wheat in the winter and store it so that you had wheat during the summer to make your bread and so on. Now, if you're storing all that wheat, um, you know, who's to say someone isn't going to come by, like marauders aren't going to come by, and take that wheat from you okay in other words you've got some primitive warfare going on now it wasn't that you know hunter gatherers didn't you know fight amongst one another but now this gets serious okay this is starting to get serious because now there's a lot at stake here all right um you know it's not just uh two uh human groups you know clashing over who's going to hunt in this area and then moving off in their own uh direction here it's a matter of life and death because if you take all the wheat from a village they're going to starve okay and so you have this uh, differentiation of um uh what people did in the village uh so it's the first time you get you know like like 
some kind of soldiers okay now they were probably both farmers and soldiers and the first time you had you know like kings or you know chieftains or whatever and so uh you get the kind of differentiation uh in social roles that you didn't have during the hunter gatherer hunter gatherer was pretty much a flat community okay there was no very little hierarchy uh but once you had the, the agricultural revolution you tended to get more of a hierarchy okay more specialization in terms of what people did that was a result of the uh the technology another result of the technology is you were living with animals and you know that diseases can jump from animals to humans so guess what a whole new um collection of diseases came into the uh, human race okay and um uh Again, you know, this is not my specialty, uh, uh, this is not my, my expertise here, but you know, uh, apparently, you know, there's like the, uh, uh, the, there's the Paleolithic diet, you might have heard about this, and they think that maybe, even though life was harder, that maybe humans were healthier on the kind of Paleolithic foods that they were eating rather than the uh, uh, agricultural foods, okay? Not my expertise at all, I'm just saying, you know, that, that this is where that kind of distinction comes from, okay? I mean, in case you want to study it a little bit more, but for our purposes, it's important to understand that the technology changed society. And that's a theme that's going to go on and on and on throughout all of all of what we're going to be uh, uh, talking about today. OK, so. All right. So there's the agricultural revolution. And let me just remind you that it's called the Neolithic. And again, why is it Neolithic? Because our tools were stone tools. OK, uh, you know, we, we got better and better and better at making stone tools. OK, so you can see that these are pretty good, uh, well polished tools, but uh, still they were stone tools and stone tools have some advantages and disadvantages. OK, so what do you think happened next? What do you think the next major uh, revolution was? Well, uh, if you take a look at the tools in your uh, like in your kitchen, got a knife a fork spoons all those they're not made out of stone i mean they might be you know that'd be funny but you know like most of our um cutlery is not made out of stone it could be made out of wood okay and um you know wood is okay but wood is not good for a lot of things like you know a wood plow doesn't last very long it breaks very easily okay so if you're trying to till a plow is used to break up the soil okay so if you're trying to till your soil you know, turn over your soil with a plow, a wooden plow, you know, I don't know, that's not going to work so well. Uh, you could do, try a, a stone plow, but stone, you can't really get a stone that big. It'd be too heavy. Okay. So the next major thing that came about is we learned how to work with metal. Okay. We did this in several stages and, and this is actually important too. So the next major revolution was the so-called Bronze Age. Okay, and you could see that it wasn't that much longer after the beginning of the agricultural revolution that you got into the Bronze Age. Let me just move this down so you can see everything. Okay, good. So, you know, the Bronze Age was about 5,000 years ago. That puts it at 3,000 BC, okay, uh, BC before Christ. Okay, so 3,000 years before uh, uh, year one, okay. And uh, uh, these civilizations are now much, much more sophisticated than the earlier civilizations. I mean, we have a lot of specialization in terms of uh, what they did. And uh, probably the most famous example, one that you would know, are like the old Egyptians, okay. Now, I say old here rather than Egyptians is because the Egyptian Empire, went through several phases okay so uh, there was like the old empire and then the middle and then the new and then there was some intermediate um, periods as well but the the original uh, um, uh, the oldest Egyptian uh, empire was uh, actually a bronze age empire they're the ones that built the pyramids okay and uh, those pyramids they were believe it or not they were built using uh, bronze tools okay and so um, bronze is much better than stone uh, you can make bronze into different shapes. You can cast it, okay? And so let me just describe a little bit about bronze technology. So uh, let's, uh, where am I here? Let's move on to bronze, okay? So, uh, you know, uh, this is uh, an example of just cast bronze, okay? And it's it's something ornamental, but, you know, just so you could see it. And we still use bronze, Okay, for um, not not really for anything serious, but you know we do have things that are made out of bronze uh, and uh, more likely brass. Okay, so let me tell you what bronze is. I think you can see it right there. Okay, all right. So that's a little small for you, but uh, if you read the Wikipedia page on the Bronze Age, you could see that um, what it says is that bronze is made out of copper 
and tin, okay? Now, there was actually a brief period before the Bronze Age known as the Copper Age, and uh, there's copper. So copper is uh, the metal that we use for like our, our electrical wires, okay? Uh, and you can see that, you know, an electrical wire is very easy to, um, um, to, to bend. So copper is actually a very soft metal. It's a bendable metal, okay? And the other metal is tin, okay? And believe it or not, tin is also a very malleable metal. Okay, it's very soft. And so you go, uh, you know, like tin cans. You go, well, wait a minute, copper's soft and tin is soft, but if you mix the two together, it turns out that they're hard, okay? And so that's why the Bronze Age was important because you didn't really have, you wouldn't have been able to make any tools out of just copper. Okay, and you can't make tools out of tin because they're too soft. Mixing them together makes for a harder metal. I won't go into the physics of why, but um, that's um, uh, uh, that's what bronze is. Okay, nowadays we tend to have brass, and brass is a mix of um, of um, I believe copper and zinc, and it's a, it's a little bit different. Okay, and so you know like there are brass tubas and things like that. You'll notice that brass tubas like uh, like the like the instruments that you have at, at school, uh, like in high school, or I remember these from high school, like a, a tuba or, or uh, trumpets or whatever, they're made out of uh, brass. And they're, they're, um, they're, they're pretty soft and they get dented up uh, pretty easy uh, as well, okay? So just like bronze, it gets dented up pretty easy. It's not the st strongest metal, but it's certainly stronger than copper by itself or tin by itself, okay? So this was definitely improvement, an improvement. And uh, now this is, um, ornamental but you could see the kinds of like things that they could make okay and so you could make uh, things like um, like uh, swords bronze swords uh, you could have chisels out of bronze and so on uh, they're not anywhere near as good as iron which we'll talk about in a second but uh, it, it's still good enough that you could do um, you know could do things with it okay and so it was definitely an improvement uh, over um, the previous uh, stone okay now how in the world did they discover this Okay, so remember, the, you know, up to up to the um, up to this point, they were basically working with uh, with stone tools, and that's pretty obvious. You just find the stones on the ground, and over um, uh, tens of thousands of years, we learned how to polish the stone to make it into the shape that we wanted. But how in the world did we ever discover metal? And you'll see that it's kind of interesting because you need this thing called a bloomery. Okay, let me make that picture bigger. Okay, and so what we discovered is. Um, and you can see, you can almost see how it happened historically. We discovered that if you take certain rocks and you put them in a fire, that something will melt out of them, okay? And that's something that melts out of them is, is as a metal, okay? Now, uh, copper in the wild is kind of greenish color because it's copper oxide, but when you put it in a fire, okay, in this bloomery here, uh, the copper will melt and it'll come out through the bottom here. You can see that hole, okay? And uh, you collect it and uh, there's your source of copper. You could do the same thing with tin and then you melt the two again with fire and you mix them together and you get um, uh, bronze. And then you could sh you can actually cast the bronze, which means that you can put it in a mold and you'll get the uh, shape of the thing that you want, but then you have to polish it and and uh, make, sharpen it or do whatever you have to do with it, okay? And this led to the Bronze Age, okay? Now the Bronze Age, um, let me see here, the Bronze Age, see if there's, I think there's a timeline down here. Yeah, it, I don't think you can see it that well. It, it's not that important. Uh, basically, uh, you know, um, maybe I can make that just a bit bigger for you. Yeah, okay. I could probably see that a little bit better. Yeah, you could see the Bronze Age there, uh, that minus 3000, that's like 3000 BC. And it continues, okay. Uh, there's three stages to it, the late, early Bronze Age, medium and uh, intermediate, and then the, the late Bronze Age. And you could see that it starts to end about um, uh, 1200 BC, okay. And you might wonder what happened, okay. Like what happened that um, uh, made bronze go away? And the answer basically is that uh, a better technology was discovered, okay? And that is iron, all right? I'll tell you how iron is made in just a minute. Okay, so there's the Iron Age. And the Iron Age is r very rough numbers, about 3,000 years ago or about 1,000 BC, okay? The Iron Age totally supplanted the Bronze Age. In fact, all of the, the, um, the Middle East, Okay, especially the, the part of the Middle East that's near the uh, Mediterranean. That would be like Lebanon and Israel today, okay? And, and also um, uh, Turkey, okay? That entire area was 
all Bronze Age civilization. And uh, it was a very sophisticated civilization, just like the Egyptians. In fact, the Egyptians were part of it. Okay. And what happened was, is um, we don't know for sure. Okay. There are different theories. So the, the theory that I'm going to give you is may or may not be true, but they were invaded. They were invaded by uh, what were called the sea people. At least that's what the Egyptians called them. And the sea people actually carried iron weapons and the uh, Bronze Age people, they had bronze shields and bronze uh, breastplates and so on. And guess what? Iron is much, much stronger than uh, bronze. And so an iron sword will go through bronze, uh, bronze breastplate. Okay. Better technology, better warfare, the civilization falls apart. Now that's one theory. There's other theories that say, you know, that the tin supplies dried up, the trade fell apart. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Um, certainly the iron is a much better technology than uh, bronze. Okay. Uh, but um, you know, exactly what caused the fall of Bronze Age civilization, which gave way to Iron Age, uh, you know, that's, you know, for other classes to, to talk about, okay? But what I do want to say is that once, you know, you got to the Bronze Age, everything you had during the Agricultural Revolution with the kind of um, uh, specialization of, of uh, roles, be, you know, went on steroids, okay? So uh, now you had like a, uh, like a professional military, okay? And you had like a priestly class, okay, with the worship of gods and so on. And uh, society became very sophisticated, okay? Uh, much more so than the agricultural age. And you had, you know, wide scale warfare, all right? And um, uh, so, you know, everything is kind of being stepped up now. And so you say to yourself, geez, why, if this, new technology is so much better why does it bring so much um bad in its way and this is another thing about technology it, it kind of becomes impossible to go back the other way you might say uh you know even in your own own life you go geez it's a real pain to take care of a car you got to get the oil change you got to fill put a gas in it you got to do all these things to take care of your car and not only your car but there's a lot of technological things in our life that you have to take care of okay even simple things like your house you got if you have a house or whatever um you, you got to take care of your house and so all of these things uh, have a, a maintenance uh, associated with them uh and you go well why don't i just get rid of it okay uh, just get rid of your car uh how far are you going to get in life because all of society builds itself around this new technology, say a car, it becomes impossible, or I don't know if impossible is the right word, but very difficult for any one individual to live without a car. Okay. Now I did, uh, I lived, uh, I think seven years without a car. Um, and, uh, this is, um, you know, during periods of time when I was a graduate student and even when I moved here to Buffalo in 1995, I was able to live for a few, quite a few years without a car. Okay. I used public transportation and stuff like that. And, uh, it's not that I can't drive. I drive now, but I just, I tried it, you know, and, uh, it's very difficult. I mean, I had to choose an apartment that was near a grocery store and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, Anyhow, and I wound up uh, borrowing cars and when I had to for like um, you know, specialized special cases and things like that. So, you know, it's not at all easy. And I'm going to give you another example of what's not easy. Try living without a phone. OK, now your phone is a little different. Uh, you know, you literally carry it with you. But if you go back 20 years, like, I don't know, like um, the late 90s, early 2000s, I know that's that's a long time ago, you know, for a human lifetime. OK, well, 20 years isn't that long ago, but you understand that 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 isn't that long ago on this geological time scale that I gave you. Try living without a phone. So if you want to do an exercise to really like appreciate what I'm getting at in, in this entire um, story is, uh, you know, when the technology enters your your society, it, everyone has to adopt it, even if it brings something bad with it you have to adopt it because if you don't, you, you start to fall behind in your society. Like maybe you could live like the Amish. You can make like little small societies. Okay. Uh, where you say, okay, well within this group, we're not going to do that. All right. Or maybe like on, on mon in a monastery or something like that, you could restrict your technology. And this is attractive to people. Okay. They might become increasingly attractive as our technology becomes more and more oppressive to us. Uh, all right. But you know, generally speaking, it's really hard to step back out of that. Okay, to step back in time or to step out of it. And so, you know, from the agriculture to the Bronze Age, if you were a village and you didn't did not adopt Bronze Age technologies, you were just swallowed up. That's all there is to it. You know, someone will come in and say, you know what, um, you think you live on your own and you think you're an autonomous village. Nope, 
You're under our empire now. You're under the Egyptian empire and uh, give us your, you know, give us like 10% of your grain. Otherwise, uh, we'll just come and take it. And uh, there you go, taxation. So that's another thing that started in the Bronze Age was taxation, okay? Uh, where a certain amount of, um, uh, of the produce of the land was levied by the central government in order to run its military and things like that, okay? Starting to sound very modern, isn't it? Okay, so uh, there you go, that's the Bronze Age. Now, um, the, you could think of the Iron Age, which only happened about 1,000 to 2,000 years later. So I have about 2,000 years in there from the beginning of the Bronze Age to the beginning of the Iron Age. Um, you know, Iron Age beginning about 1,000 BC, you know, you say, well, um, what's the difference between the two? Uh, the Iron Age is just the Bronze Age on steroids, okay? And simply because iron is so much harder metal than uh, bronze, okay? And examples here, if you want to say, well, who were uh, an Iron Age people? The ancient Greeks... Okay, going right back to the beginning of the Greeks, what's called the Greek Dark Ages, about 800 BC or so. That's like, um, if you've studied this in your other courses, people like Homer or Hesiod, you know, some of those really early um, uh, Greek myths. Okay, um, so even back then, even as early as, you know, the Greeks understood themselves as a people, uh, they had, um, uh, um, you know, iron. Okay, I should say that's different than the early, really, the archaic Greeks, which would have been like uh, the the Mycenaeans or the uh, the Minoans. They they were Bronze Age. Okay, but you know, like um, the 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 um, uh, Greeks from like Homer's time, from about 800 BC on, they were an Iron Age. And the Romans, the ancient Romans, were uh, Iron Age. Okay, and so uh, that's you know civilizations that you should think of okay uh, same kind of uh, um, internal social structures as the bronze age but like i said on steroids okay and uh, you only have to think about the roman army which was you know definitely a professional army which was able to uh, conquer and unify all of europe okay now um how do you go from the bronze age to the iron age so remember to get bronze you have to melt uh copper out of rocks and you have to melt tin out of rocks okay and that's easy to do all you have to do is light a campfire put these rocks in there and the stuff will just the the copper will just melt out and it'll just pool up in the bottom of the fire and then you could just take it out okay or if you want to do it more sophist in a more sophisticated fashion you could use that bloomery that i showed you but iron doesn't work like that iron or rock is kind of reddish it's rust it's rust it's rust inside of rocks if you put those rocks in a fire and you light a fire it doesn't melt out and you go, well, now what? How do I get the iron out of there? Well, I don't even know if they knew there was iron in there because, you know, how are you going to know there's iron in there? But they had to discover a new thing, okay? And so that new thing was, let me see here. Uh, that's the, this is the, okay, so this is the wiki page on, oops, hold on. This is the wiki page on the Iron Age. Okay, uh, we'll come back to that. I want to show you this. Okay, so here's a bunch of pictures, and what you're looking at are what are known as bellows. Okay, and bellows. So th this picture right here, where my cursor is, okay, that is a good example of a, a bellow. Uh, basically, it's um, uh, you know, you, you just kind of squeeze it and it squirts air out through the front. So here, here you can see the nozzle and it'll squirt air out through there. Okay. Now, you know that if you blow on a fire, the fire gets hotter. Okay. So you blow on a fire, it gets hotter, but you can't just sit there and blow on a fire with your lungs and, um, you know, be able to make the fire hotter. What you need is a machine that does that. And that's exactly what the bellows are. Okay. By squeezing the bellows, it squeezes out air. And then when you open them up again, when you, you know, um, so when you squeeze in the air, it comes out through the nozzle. When you open them up, these valves suck in the air. And so the air is always traveling out through the nozzle and in through these valves as you, as you pump it. Okay. Now, um, you might have seen these because they were used even till recently. Uh, do I have a picture here? Here we go. All right. So they were used even up until recently in uh, blacksmiths. This is how blacksmiths uh, uh, would, you know, work with horseshoes and, and iron horseshoes and things like that, okay, to shape the horseshoes. Now, what's going on is that when you um, squeeze the air through the bellows, it makes the fire hotter. And if you make the fire hot enough, then you can melt the iron out of the rock, okay? So without the bellows, if you just have a, um, a plain old um, 
if you just have a plain old uh, uh, fire, like a campfire, and you put iron ore rock in it, it will not melt the uh, the iron out of it. But if you make the fire hotter with a belt with bellows, uh, it will. Okay. And uh, let me see if I could just make that a little bit bigger. I think you can see what what you're looking at there. But uh, here, let's try to. There you go. Okay. And you can see uh, he's got some instruments to hold like a horseshoe in the, in the fire uh, so he doesn't burn himself. Uh, these tongs there. And there's the, there's the nozzle of the bellow, okay, uh, into the, uh, the coals. And you just blow on that and it makes the coals uh, extra hot. Okay, so <clears throat> that had to be invented first. And if you think about that, you wonder, geez, how in the world did they ever figure out how to uh, uh, make... Uh, a bellow and to be honest I don't know but that's what you what was required okay and um, I think there's a timeline here so so there's a there's a, a, a wiki article if you're interested <clears throat> not that you need more than just what I'm telling you in the course but if you're interested you could just look by <coughs> excuse me you can just look up the Iron Age or here I've got um, Iron Age Europe uh, okay and the Iron Age started in different parts of the world or at least traveled to different parts of the world but the the European one uh, you know this one shows uh, I think there's a timeline here it is yeah so uh, what you're looking at the timeline as you could see here this is minus uh, 1300 so that's like 1300 BC and then you can see here where it says the Greek Dark Ages okay and it can, uh, progresses all the way up to um, I guess until the next uh, revolution, you can see here there are the pre-Romans and the Romans and so on. Okay, so um, that's your Iron Age uh, civilization. All right. And of course, like anything else, once you get to the Iron Age, uh, you're not going to go back to the Bronze Age. It's not that you don't have the older technology. It's still there. It's just like why use it when you've got something better. Now, we see that today with some of our technologies. Okay. Okay. Uh, our technologies today, they mostly but not totally displace older technologies. So I gave you the example of a car earlier. Uh, a car, what did it displace? It displaced like the horse or the horse and carriage. Okay. Uh, it's not that we don't have horses and carriages today. We still have horse and carriage. Uh, but we just use them for like quaint things like, you know, I don't know, like maybe a wedding or something like that. Or you just have these kind of quaint, you go to like a Renaissance village or a, 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 like a, a pioneer village and you want to go for a horse and carriage ride and you can go for a horse and carriage ride. Okay. But we don't seriously get around our cities with horse and carriage because the, um, the our car has mostly displaced that technology. Another example, this is uh, a pen, writing with a pen, okay? So pens, you know, ink and all that, uh, I mean, I, I don't know how far back it goes, but we know, we do know that uh, the ancient Egyptians had that, okay? So writing goes back at least to the Bronze Age. Um, and um, I don't know if it goes before uh, the Bronze Age, um, before the early Bronze Age or not, but during the Bronze Age, like all technologies are born out of some, some need, you know, uh, they had to just have a record of like, you know, how many cows did we exchange, you know, like business transaction records. And that's where writing started. OK. And uh, it started in a place called Sumeria, which we actually know that. OK. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we have pen and paper and we still use pen and paper today. But uh, do we use pen and paper? Like, am I using pen and paper here? Not really. I'm using some digital word processor okay it's actually a text editor okay but you could you could see that now our text editors and word processors they're kind of replacing pen and paper and we kind of want to get away from pen and paper because it's annoying but you know what you still have pen and paper you know if i have to put a note up on my door uh what else is there except pen and paper so newer technologies mostly but not totally displace the older technologies the older technologies will just find niche uses OK, uh, whereas the newer technology uh, will will kind of dominate the center of life. And that's what happened in the Iron Age. OK. All right. I think I've said enough about that. And uh, uh, again, at this point, uh, society is quite sophisticated. Uh, if you went back to the ancient Romans, you would recognize most of what they did. Uh, you probably would see it as kind of like a pioneer village type life. OK, something like that. So that's 2000 years ago. So, you know, that 2000 years ago and say two three hundred years ago nothing much changed between about you know 1 AD and about 
I don't know, the 1600s or something like that. As far as technology goes, a lot of other things went on, okay, in terms of like philosophy and religion and things like that, but not a lot in terms of technology. Not totally, you know, there were things that were invented, like um, I think the windmill was invented during the Middle Ages and things like that. But generally speaking, you have to really wait until you get to the next major revolution, which is ta -da, the Industrial Revolution, okay? And now I, I really want you to take a look at these numbers, you know, like we're, we're, uh, the, the, the amount of time between these is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay. So um, humans, you know, again, we've been here 200,000 years for 95% of that time, we're hunter gatherers. And then for 5% where we do agriculture and then for, you know, an even smaller percentage uh, we're doing, um, we're, we're, we've got metal work and now we get to the industrial revolution okay which is only about 300 years ago maybe 400 it depends how you want to see um what the industrial revolution uh, is all about but uh that was a major change okay and we are still living in the shadow of the industrial revolution in fact some people might think that the um the computer computers are part of the industrial revolution and they are but i think computers bring in something extra and so i don't want to quite make them into like uh, i don't want to roll them into pure industrial revolution okay so um uh what 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 is this industrial revolution all about okay um and the answer is um that basically it is the technology of replication Okay, or replicating things. So if you take a look uh, at a car, like my car is a 2017 Honda Fit. And you take a look at all 2017 Honda Fits, and they're pretty much identical. Okay, not totally. They're different sub-models, but you know, generally speaking, they're almost identical. Okay, and uh, that means that uh, they're not only identical in their exterior look, the pieces inside are identical. So you could take like, I don't know, like you could take a, car, uh, a seat, like a passenger seat out of one and you can put it in the other. They're, they're interchangeable. In fact, they're manufactured independently and then assembled together, okay? And so you see this replication. If you take a look around, you know, your house, you're gonna see that, you know, uh, you're gonna have things that like tables that are identical to one another. You go, well, how did they come out identical? Well, that's because machines made them and they weren't made by humans, okay? So, you know, when humans used to make tables and, uh, and we still buy handmade uh, um, furniture, we find it quaint. We like it. So again, this is one of those technologies that hasn't been totally displaced. But you know, we find it very quaint that um, there's this uh, uh, handmade stuff. You know, you can buy it from the Amish or the um, um, whatever like uh, uh, groups that will make handmade tools. Okay, and uh, they have character. We'll say they have character. And what we mean by that is that you know each individual chair is slightly different than another one. Okay, and uh, we might like that. All right. And so, um, although it's possible with, you know, um, lathes and things like that to, to make nearly identical tables, you know, handmade stuff can look, um, can be unique. And we like that uniqueness. But if you take a look at, say, the chairs around your dining room table, they're identical. Okay. For all intents and purposes, they're identical. So what happened? What happened was, is there's a machine and that machine is making the, the pieces. Okay, and then they're getting assembled together, okay? And so one way of thinking of the Industrial Revolution is to think about it in terms of mechanization, like assembly lines, replication, okay? And so wherever you see things that are identical, you identically man manufactured items, you see that there was some machine with precision behind it that was able to do that. There's another sense to the Industrial Revolution. And uh, you could see that when we went to the Iron Age, we had this bellows, okay? And the bellows, um, let me just show it to you again. And uh, so you could see it. Uh, oh, let's go to, there we go. You take a look at these bellows. And you might say, well, what human thing is that okay like uh, we could have even gone back earlier to like the uh, the stone tools you might say the stone tools are an extension of the hand okay and you might say well what are the bellows well why did we need them to blow on fire well why can't we blow with our lungs well we can't because you know you get tired so you can think of bellows as kind of like mechanical lungs okay and so we've got all these kinds of like things that we did with our bodies and we exteriorize them into um you know some kind of machinery and so another idea behind the uh, the industrial revolution are uh mechanical muscles okay now muscles means like 
parts of the human body that you know is animated or moved like you know but made into a machine um one which predates even the the industrial revolution is like the lever the lever is like used for li lifting things we don't have to go into the details but that's basically a mechanical arm okay so you know all of this kind of uh, exteriorization of uh human body parts and our functions you could call them mechanical muscles and that's kind of an interesting idea uh, and um, I'm going to reference uh, a video that you should watch after mine by CGP Gray. OK, but, uh, you know, he calls these things uh, mechanical muscles, although he's he isn't um, the first person to call it mechanical muscles. But mechanical muscles, you could distinguish from what we're going to talk about as our last industrial as our last uh, technological revolution, which is computers, which you might call mechanical minds. OK, so these are things that do, you know, work with information the way our brains do. All right. So that's what the Industrial Revolution is about. If you want to say, like, what is it? What is about the uh, what is the essence of the uh, Industrial Revolution? OK, because there's all these different machines. You can go, well, they're, they, they seem all disparate from one another. No, they're all basically uh, have this uh, function of replicating. OK, like repeatedly doing the same thing over and over and over again, the way a human would, but with much more precision and also with muscle. OK, now, where did it begin? So let's go back to this. The um, Industrial Revolution kind of began with this device. Hold on here. Uh, this device here. OK, this device here. Now, this is the manual version of the device. OK, so, uh, you know, all through the um, uh, this lecture, I've been talking about food. OK, uh, and, you know, uh, not food, but, you know, just like our, our Sorry, I should say I started off with food, okay? It's the, one of the driving forces that let, pushed our technology. But another driving force is clothing, okay? Now, humans make clothing not just for modesty, okay, because we're, we're, we're embarrassed by our, 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 our uh, exposed bodies, but also you need clothing um, against the weather, against the elements, okay? Uh, you wouldn't last very long in Buffalo without a coat, okay? You, oh, you wouldn't be able to go outside, okay? So clothing has been essential uh, all through the time of our species, okay? And so um, when the agricultural revolution began, uh, we not only used uh, sheep and goat for uh, their meat, but we discovered that they had fur, OK, well, wool and you could cut the wool off and you could uh, kind of like twist the wool into string. And then once you got the string, you could weave it. OK, and this is kind of like crochet or, um, or or knitting. OK, so actually it's more like knitting. OK, but it, this is knitting on steroids because what you've got here is a, 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 a loom and you could see um, in her hand she's got this. Um, I forget what it's called, but it's, it's basically got string attached to it. She's going to throw it through the middle of the string there, and then she's going to, uh, you know, interlace it so that it kind of makes the cross string. And that's how these, um, the, 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 the cloth is made, okay, the textile is made, is by these strings interweaving with other strings, interweaving with other strings, okay. Now, you can imagine uh, how much work this is, okay. Today, there are still people that do it. You could see here, this is a, a loom uh, that, um, that this woman is working on and um, it's done today more for like uh, a hobby okay but once upon a time this was the only way to make clothing okay going right back to ancient times in fact if you look at uh, we were talking about uh, uh, Homer so if you look at the Homeric legends you know like in the Odyssey um, Penelope uh, you know she sp would spin her loom okay and what she she would make this this uh, uh, tapestry uh, overnight using her loom okay and so uh, you know so this goes back way back to like you know um, uh, probably the Bronze Age or, or not, if not earlier okay um, so anyhow uh, a lot of work and what happened during the Industrial Revolution is that a mechanical version of this that did not need a human being that was powered basically by windmill uh, was invented okay and um, I looked around and I found this uh, hold on here this picture here OK, and um, uh, this is basically the uh, equivalent of what you saw there as a loom. But now this is purely mechanical and, you know, it's an isolated picture, but this would have been driven by, um, you know, say windmill or by some other um, or later on by steam power, or by some other motor that or engine that would uh, turn the loom. And then as the loom turned, it would just 
produce this textile on its own. Okay, and um, you could take a look that uh, the Industrial Revolution. You could see in this picture here. You could see here it starts. Uh, they have it starting at about 1700s, which is about 300 years ago, and then progressing all the way up to not quite to the 1900s. Okay, so up to you know a little over 100 years ago, and um, you know there's a lot of different. Uh, um, items that were created like one of the things that were invented i guess is a better word one of the things that was invented here's our mechanical loom that i just showed you a minute ago okay so that's used for weaving for producing textile but um more than that you know that uh there was also like uh the steam engine okay that was invented during the industrial revolution and of course the steam engine leads to trains which is basically like mechanical legs and uh and so on okay and you get here you go there's your locomotive and so uh you know this is the age of steampunk right uh you know when uh, all these machines were being made call them mechanical muscles basically they did everything that you could do but much faster and with great precision okay so uh there's the industrial revolution now what well so what well the theme of this and don't forget the reason I'm I'm teaching you all this. It's not not for any reason, not for you know, just for historical uh, curiosity. Uh, it changes our society. Okay, you can imagine what happened when the mechanical loom displaced all those workers. So the textile industry was a very big industry because everyone needs clothes. Okay, and so um, suddenly you don't need all these human beings to make. The clothing you can fire all your workers and uh, just replace them with mechanical looms and what does that mean well what it meant in england was uh, a tremendous amount of uh, poverty because a lot of people were suddenly um, displaced from their jobs it's even worse than that a lot of farmers were displaced from their farms because how did you farm before that well, you could use animals like plow animals to pull, you know, plows and things like that. But now, you know, the equivalent of your steam engine would have been like a tractor trailer. OK, and you could actually till the soil by a machine. And even though you needed a driver, at least one person to run it, you could do a lot more work in very little time. OK, or much less, less time. So suddenly all these uh, farm hands had no work. They went to the cities, but then in the cities you had the same problem and you had uh, widespread poverty. OK, this is the world of Charles uh, Dickens. OK, with a lot of uh, poverty and underclass being formed. All right. We're like mid 1850s or things like that. And uh, this is this is horrible because um, it led to a reaction to social unrest okay and what was this social unrest okay and again this social unrest is being driven by um it's being driven by um the uh the new technology it led to what are called the luddites okay now um don't know exactly all of this history but uh uh ned ludd was apparently the leader of the luddites we don't don't know who he is it, it doesn't really matter that much but uh, basically these luddites what they did was they went around smashing mechanical looms okay because they had been uh, all these um, loom workers had been had lost their jobs they've been displaced uh what they did was they would just uh, destroy the new mechanical looms in the hope of getting their jobs back okay uh that doesn't quite work like that okay technology unfortunately even though it causes this kind of social disruption just has this really bad like it just gets into a society and it's, it's pernicious and it's not possible to go back. OK, but nonetheless, uh, society has to adjust to it. And that adjustment is um, quite, um, uh, quite disruptive. OK, so these are the Luddites and uh, it led to, you know, uh, movements like in the uh, 1850s. I guess I shouldn't I picked communism here. I probably should have uh, said Marxism because Marxism, Karl Marx, you know, when he talked about the means of production and all that thing. And by the way, I'm not I'm not endorsing Marxism or anything like that. I'm just simply telling you, uh, where, you know, what where this comes from, um, where it came from was the idea that uh, the means of production and by means of production, he just meant the machines, the, the industrial machines. They were in the hands of these these few people that were making all the money okay and they were just displacing large amounts of society and so he was kind of like continuing uh, this Karl Marx was kind of continu continuing in the um, Luddite idea of you know what will uh, rather than smashing the machines we'll just take them we'll just take them and we'll 
we'll make them part of the commune or we'll com communize them okay now that's not the way history worked out okay and again i that's not part of this course but the point is that um, this led to tremendous amount of uh, social unrest okay and so um you know the industrial revolution is even though it started about 300 years ago you know uh you can think about how these machines have basically displaced people uh and um that brings us to the last uh industrial sorry so the last uh, technological revolution that i think people would agree is happening right now okay i don't think it's over yet and that is the information age or the information revolution or sometimes known as the digital revolution or digital age you know history will give it a better name than i can give it right now okay we'll see where it goes but uh this is also having some disruptive effects on our society okay and uh it's not clear where this is going to go uh i don't want to make any predictions the point of this is not to make uh, predictions about where um, the technology will go in the future although it is kind of fun to speculate about it but definitely it is uh, having an impact um, the first impact that uh, I ever noticed in my lifetime were ATM machines uh, you know suddenly uh, and they came out in the 90s okay suddenly I did not have to go to the bank to get money out of the bank like to get cash okay and uh, you know this was in the days where credit cards were uh, kind of rare all right nowadays i i don't know this is funny but i don't even remember the last time i actually used cash to buy anything you just go to the store and you just use a credit card for everything or debit card or whatever you have okay and everything is done electronically but i remember when atms first came out um tellers lost their jobs okay and uh what happened to them i don't know i mean society kind of absorbed this all right. But as um, time continues, uh, you know, the technology has kind of grown more and more and more and it's come into our society in ways that you cannot expect. And I guess this is the last kind of thing about technology. You know, uh, it's not like, you know, <laughs> the early homo sapiens could say something like, you know what, maybe we maybe we shouldn't invent uh, uh, maybe we shouldn't invent uh, a farming because that would be a bad idea. So don't do this farming thing. We don't know. We simply discover these things. And they start to make their way into our society. And you don't even know they're going to lead to a technological revolution because people are um, discovering new things all the time. And these new discoveries, probably a lot of discoveries, or if you even want to call them that, go nowhere. Okay, but some of them take off. And they start to, you know, dig their way into our society. They become pernicious, okay? And they transform it. And that's when you really have a technological revolution, okay? It's not the the, the, the discovery. And these things happen, um, you know, n without necessarily the full consciousness of humans about what they're doing. We simply create these things and they, they make their way into our society and then we live with them. Uh, an example of this, which is at the end of the Industrial Revolution, okay and it's really serious was uh um nuclear weapons or uh, well, i guess you could say the good side of that and maybe like uh, uh nuclear power plants and nuclear weapons uh certainly you know since world war ii in the 50s um early 50s uh nuclear weapons have totally transformed our world in terms of like how we do geopolitics okay now you don't experience that on a day-to-day -day basis but uh you know uh like during the cold war you know uh, the kinds of things that the U.S. worried about, the kinds of things that the Soviet Union worried about, the, where they put all their effort was very much driven by making sure that they stay ahead of the other side. Because if one side got it technologically ahead of the other side, they might say, you know what, we can beat them. And they would, you know, fire off uh, their nukes. And uh, well, there was this idea of mutually assured destruction that kept the balance in the world between these uh, nuclear uh, warheads, okay? So, you know, this is really serious stuff, okay? And you say, well, um, you know, why didn't we just say, like in the uh, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, why didn't we just say, you know, this nuclear this nuclear energy thing, it's not a good idea, let's not do it. The thing is, is at the time you had no idea. Um, the physicists that were working on nuclear energy in the early days, uh, a lot of them, like uh, like uh, Madame Curie, they died of cancer because they were playing with this stuff. They didn't know what they were doing. They were just discovering the stuff and discovering some of the bad stuff, bad uh, as aspects about nuclear energy. And they were just discovering it. And, and by the time, you know, people started to realize what the repercussions of this were, uh, there was kind of already an arms race going on, or at least a uh, you know, a nuclear technology race going on to see w what could happen, what we could do with it, because you had to stay ahead of the other side. And um, 
that's what's that's what's going on okay uh with these technologies it's you know, if we knew maybe if we could somehow see the future and say ah maybe we shouldn't develop this technology we might not do it but chances are as soon as you say don't invent this technology you already know that the technology exists it's already too late okay it's already too late um and um, uh, so uh, that's the uh, the information age, okay, that we're in right now. And uh, I'm just going to leave you with one last thought um, before I show you um, what you need to do next, okay? Uh, and the um, um, the uh, the idea is this: you know, like uh, the story of Adam and Eve, and they they eat the apple. This is one of the oldest uh, stories. It actually goes right back to the Sumerians, like we're talking right back here at the agricultural revolution point you know they eat the apple and suddenly uh they know they have this knowledge of good and evil you know I mean, there's been a lot of interpretations of that story but you know what my interpretation it's it's a bit whimsical it's but maybe that apple is technology and the thing is is that you know before you take a bite of the apple you go uh, why not let's let's do this thing okay and then you take a bite of the apple and you go oh, geez maybe we shouldn't have done that but there's no going back there's no going back. And so this technology thing is always this forward grinding thing. And, it, uh, you know, like um, a lot of people have had a kind of a dark view of technology for this for this very reason, because it could bring us to this dark place uh, for humanity and we might not be able to back out of it. OK. Uh, and so, you know, like in the information age, um, uh, you know, if you've ever watched the, uh, the the Terminator movies where there's Skynet and you have this thing in science fiction known as the singularity. And this is when computers become so intelligent that they just take over the world and we humans are in their way. OK, so I a little bit now we're now we're pushing science fiction. OK, uh, but my my point is, is that you say, well, why do people even think that it's because of this kind of forward progression? and our technology, the sense that, you know, we don't always know what we're doing. We bring this technology into the world and then we're stuck with it. You don't go back. OK, so um, that's it for um, the information. Uh, let me go back to our um, page here. OK, so, um, you know, I've been talking for like, I guess, an, uh, an hour and a half now. And uh, here's the summary for that, for what I've said now. OK, and um, at the very bottom of that summary, okay, you'll see a um, a link here to a uh, YouTube video. All right, uh, I'm not going to play it right now because uh, it, it's bad practice to you know incorporate copyrighted material or YouTube videos within another one. But uh, just click on that. It's by uh, CGP Gray. Okay, he's a, a YouTuber, and uh, he made a, a, this video known as um, or entitled uh, "Humans Need Not Apply." Okay, humans need not apply, and uh, um, what he talks about in this video is um, the idea of just how uh, computer technology is changing um, our world today. OK, and now this is a kind of an older video. I forget it goes back to 2014, I think, or something like that or 2013. I'm not sure. Uh, so, you know, that's, it's getting pretty old, but it's still very pertinent. And what he talks about is, um, you know, uh, first, uh, you know, the Industrial Revolution, mechanical muscles, uh, computers as mechanical minds. OK, and these mechanical minds are now not just displacing, you know, uh, ordinary blue collar jobs. They're actually displacing even white collar jobs. So there are um, uh, artificial intelligence programs. OK, so these are computer programs that are capable of operating as if they were intelligent. I don't think they're sentient in the way humans are, but still they're able to do uh, intelligent things. And so, uh, you know, talks about uh, IBM's Watson. Uh, because this is an older video, he doesn't mention one of the things that one of the things that Watson is being used for today. But IBM Watson, which is this AI program, is an expert system, is actually being used today uh, to do um, uh, uh, accounting and taxes. OK, H&R Block, I believe, uses it. OK, I don't know if they still use it, but they were certainly using it a few years ago. And so basically, instead of having a human accountant, you have an AI accountant. Now, IBM uh, IBM Watson was actually meant to um, uh, address uh, um, doctors and uh, expertise in, in the medical field, okay, which might apply to a lot of you. And so, uh, you know, it's kind of relevant for that reason, okay. Now, uh, it, you know, it does have a kind of a dark side to it, but you don't know for sure um, what's, what the future is going to bring. But I think, you know, uh, at least 
for one lecture in a course like this, we should understand the social repercussions of what our technology is doing so that we can reflect on it. And I hope that in this you know, particular lecture, what I've done is I've given you some context in which to kind of start making sense of uh, what this uh, technology is about. Okay, so uh, this is the end of the lecture. Um, what you should do after these lectures is you should um, read the summaries. Okay, uh, maybe rewatch re the lecture, rewatch any part of the lecture that you weren't sure about. Okay, uh, reread the summaries. Okay, and uh, um, there will be assignment, uh, an assignment associated with this. And uh, it won't be a lot of questions, but it'll be a few questions. And the questions are, I'm, I'm, I'll be honest, it'll be very straightforward. The point of the questions is to just make sure that you have kind of digested the information that that is in this. Okay, um, this is not the meat of the course, but it is an important topic in the course. Okay, so uh, it'll also give you a sense of what kind of questions I can ask on the test. All right, uh, thanks everyone, and uh, bye bye.